Welcome everyone to my channel of Sewing Mischief. My name is Nicole and today we're going to be covering one of my biggest annoyances when it comes to spooky season. So we have taken witches and pirates pretty well under the umbrella of spooky. However, did you know that the golden age of piracy and the Salem witch trials took place around the same time. So you would think that for this reason, the 1690s would be an epic and incredible time period to find in all sorts of movies and TV shows and you would just see that everywhere, right? Wrong. For whatever reason, most pirate things, witch things, they put them in completely different time periods. They ignore the 1690s entirely. So that got me thinking, what did they actually wear during that time period? And I figured there was no better way to approach this than by doing a historically accurate Winifred Sanderson from Hocus Pocus, because we all know she's, she's pretty extra. But what I wouldn't the first step to this process is going to be the stays. Now, if you don't know what stays are, they are sort of the pre-corset. Don't get them mixed up with corsets exactly. They have a conical shape rather than a curvy hourglass. They don't reduce the waist, or at least they're not really meant to. They're very much there for really good posture and making sure that you have a nice smooth surface for your gown to drape over. Now, the 1690s is a very weird time period when it comes to stay because we are moving out of a time when the bodice was what was structured. So the bodice with sleeves that was meant to be seen was the actual structured garment. And we are gradually moving into a time period where stays are becoming an undergarment. It's very interesting, a very weird time period, and I really, really wanted to dig into some of the strangeness and try and understand it better. So we're going to start with one of the pairs out of the Patterns of Fashion book and see where that takes us. Now I always use gridded pattern paper whenever I am scaling things up from a book. I personally just find it a lot easier than trying to scan it in and scale it up on a computer. And it is definitely much easier than trying to do it on plain paper. All you have to do is count squares and mark them out. Now I always choose to take the pattern directly out of the book as well. I could measure it in the book and make some guesses as to how it's going to fit me, but it's just so imprecise and it makes so much more sense if I'm able to measure it when it's in its full form. I was incredibly fortunate that once I actually gridded out the pattern from the book, I discovered that it was nearly exactly the measurements that I needed it to be for my stays. So there was very little that I did to change it. The only change that I had to make was to take this little narrow one inch strip that they had added and just incorporate that into one of the nearby pieces. Now there is a reason for that one inch strip to be there. It makes the stays more adjustable that they can remove it to make the stays smaller. And that's a lot easier than cutting into a section of stays where the boning channels are stitched in. They can also add in a bigger piece really easily and adjust the size back and forth. I don't really plan on needing to do that or more so I really don't plan on taking the time to do that. I will just deal. So I'm gonna be lazy and just incorporate that and not have to seam up one more piece. I might regret that later, who knows. But that was my choice this time around. I laid out my pattern on a very heavy linen buckram, which is totally not something that is necessary at that weight. I usually use something a lot lighter, but I happen to have this fabric. I figured it would work very well for a mock-up and it wouldn't be a problem if the mock-up worked out and I ended up using it for the actual stays as well. So you don't absolutely need something this heavy. Having spent enough time around the tailors in Williamsburg, I picked up quite a few habits from them, one of which is to not add seam allowance to your pattern. Instead, you draw the stitch lines directly onto your fabric, and then the seam allowance is far less important. You don't have to worry about getting it precise. 
when you're working with stays or corsets, a single millimeter here or there can add up to be so far off in the end. And it's so much easier to simply draw out your stitch line and then make sure that you have enough space for your seam allowance and sort of hack out your pattern pieces. You'll want to draw your stitch line on both the right and the left side, but it is so much more precise and honestly so much easier than worrying about your seam allowance being perfect. Now this is the one place that I managed to take a shortcut and I machine basted around my stitch lines. You'll want to make sure that you baste your layers together. You can do this by hand or by machine, it really doesn't matter. I wasn't sure this was gonna be anything more than a mock-up, so I definitely was going to be doing it by hand. And then I went and cut open the tabs. Now I know it's a scary thing to do, but you have to do this. There is no allowance left for the hips in stays, which means that you don't have to pattern for it, and that's great, but you need those tabs there so the stays don't cut into your waist, and so they support the weight of the skirts, but they definitely are not meant to accommodate your hips without opening. So for the very first mock-up, I didn't put any boning in. I know that my body shape doesn't particularly need it. I did, however, put some pieces of cardboard down the front of the stays to make sure that it was nice and flat. And I do put one bone on either side of the center back seam for lacing so it doesn't bunch up. But as you can see here, I still had issues with bunching, mostly in sort of the middle part of my back. Now this doesn't mean that I had too long of a back necessarily. It fit very well up on top around the shoulders. The issue came in the middle back, which meant that, well, I know that I'm short-waisted. So I knew that it meant that the waistline was not in the right place. So I went ahead and split open the side seam a little bit further to see how much that would help. And it made a really big difference. So I decided in my final version, once I took off my mock-up and made some changes to it, to go ahead and cut all of the tabs just a little bit further up in the side back area. The front I left at the same waistline, it seemed to fit correctly, but that back area, I went ahead and sort of opened up a little bit more and it made a huge difference in how much everything was wrinkling and I figured the rest of it could probably be fixed once I actually boned the garment. So now that we've gotten the stays pattern to fit just a little bit better we can actually take the whole thing apart, mark all the boning channels, do all the stitching and this is where I made my biggest mistake. And I have to specify that this mistake was mostly due to my own stubbornness. So what I did was, because I'm so used to making later 18th century stays where the fashion fabric is stitched through along with the inner layers, I just started doing this lovely backstitch. I forgot that these stays are not late 18th century stays, meaning that the fabric goes over all of that stitching and you will never see it. Like, this is the only time anyone will see it, is in this video. About halfway through, I realized I was backstitching. I could have been running stitching because that is completely historically accurate for that time period. There are plenty of examples where we can see the inside and they just running stitch it because you can't see it. Why take the time to back stitch it? Running stitch it in a nice sturdy thread, you're good to go. Whew. Yeah. I'm working with a linen thread that has been waxed so it prevents the thread from fraying out with the friction of stitching. And I'm doing my first knot by way of making a loop and then stitching through it. It makes it much flatter than putting a little ball knot on the end of your thread, which doesn't seem like a big deal until you realize you're going to have dozens of those on the inside of your stays, and we want to avoid a princess and the pea effect. point that you absolutely want to hand stitch your stays. You can machine stitch your boning channels without a problem, but when it comes to the seams, you need to hand stitch that. You need to do a whip stitch over the folded edges. I have made dozens of machine stitched pairs of stays and dozens of hand stitched pairs of stays. The machine ones have a tendency to have their seam allowance rip open, and the hand stitching I have never seen that do. 
So I've chosen to go with German plastic whalebone for my actual structure of my stays. It's very flexible and adjusts to your body shape once it gets heated by your body and worn a few times. So it's very easy to work with and it's very accommodating and it really is the closest thing that I have found to baleen, but you can always do zip ties if you are on a budget or in a time crunch. Now, once I was sure that everything fit correctly, it was time to move on to all the inside reinforcements. Now, though the book does mention about where these reinforcements are, it does specify that they can't tell whether it's paper or a stiffened linen. I really love working with beetled linen. It is sort of my preferred paperweight reinforcement, and I will always choose that over other options. Instead of binding all of the edges, this particular style of stays has you actually wrap each tab individually with your layers of fabric, and then you'll end up lining each one of them individually as well, and the body fabric will cover up the raw edges on the top of the tabs. One of the most interesting construction techniques on this pair of stays for me was the center back. The edge was actually covered with a strip of silk and then the eyelets worked through that 
small piece. Then the back cover was folded along the center back edge and stitched down just a little bit further back than the eyelets, so that way there was essentially a flap that covered up all of the lacing when the stays were worn, meaning that they could be worn as an outer garment as well as an inner garment. And that's really indicative of the time period that these stays originally were made during. Previous to this point, tailors had made the vast majority of men's and women's fitted clothing. That's because it needed to have a lot of structure built in. The way that they constructed the garments and patterned the garments was something specific to the tailoring methods. And it really wasn't until the end of the 17th century that that started to change. A new type of garment called a mantua came into being, and because it was a loose-fitted, unstructured sort of gown, it was actually picked up by a completely separate group of tradespeople. They began to call themselves mantua makers. Though tailors did eventually lose out on women's gown making, they did manage to keep court gowns and stays within their trade for another hundred years. That's because stays really need to be patterned in the same way that most tailoring is done, by drawing out flat shapes based off of measures rather than by draping the fabric onto the body. And in order for mantuas and other draped gowns to work, they really need that structured undergarment to exist in the first place. So because making stays is something that is not only patterned in a way that the tailors excel at, but is made in a way that requires a great deal of strength and effort, believe me, I can vouch for that, and should stay under the umbrella of the tailoring trade. It wasn't until the early 19th century where the garment called a corset started to transition out of stays. It was something that was very, very lightly structured at the time and required far less effort and far less complex patterning than stays of the earlier time periods did. And so it was a garment that started to transition away from the tailoring trade, just like the gown had a hundred years earlier. You may have noticed that I am pinning and basting the fabric on over the stays, not flat on the table, but over one of my tailor's hams. Now, this is because with the curve around the body, you can't actually attach the silk flat. It will pull far too hard once you actually curve the entire garment. So it needs to be over a curved surface. Unfortunately, my mannequin is not well suited to the shape of stays, and I don't have someone who is the size that I am willing to stand for an hour or two while I manage to pin all of the layers around them. So instead, I'm simply working over the tailor's ham as a way to curve the garment and make sure that I don't end up pulling the seams too tight in the end. I'm finally done. And I have learned a lot about that time period of stays through this process. Notably, the fact that I cannot get myself 
into these stays. That is, that is a new thing for me. Every single pair of stays I've ever made, and I have a lot of them, I can get myself into it, no problem. Not an issue whatsoever. I lace it up loosely in front, turn it around, manage to tighten it up at the back, tie it off. Not an option with this pair of stays for a few reasons. Mostly the fact that it is so incredibly long. The tabs are really long. The top goes up so much higher with the straps than my usual stays. So I can't lace it up in front of me and turn it around because the tabs grab everything down below and try to take it with them. And the top is way higher than I can get my arms up over. It was a very bad experience. And then managing to lace that long of a thing with that many loops in back, I ended up with bruising and was very tired and very uncomfortable by the end. So the second time I got dressed, I taught my husband how to deal with it, and that was much more pleasant for me, not for him. But you really, you need someone to get you in and out of these. Also, there is a lot of work that goes into these things. It really, it took me two months to make them, and I am a fast stitcher, and that was a lot, a lot of time for me. It's been a really fun project, and I cannot wait to take this project a few steps further and incorporate all the other very exciting elements for Winifred Sanderson. I am very excited. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more of that project, I do have two more coming on this project alone and so many more fun things planned. So subscribe down below and keep an eye out for more interesting things coming your way. Mm -hmm.